Yes, the Back Chat Basketball Show is finally here. Everyone's been calling for it for months. We're here. And we're oh. finally here. No, no one even knows this exists yet. But thank you for <laughs> listening in. If you do want to find what we're doing on socials, it's backchat underscore basketball on Instagram. And if you want to watch this, we're on YouTube as well. Just search Back Chat Basketball Show. Oh, yeah. It'll come up um, on our Back Chat feed. I'm Dan Kantz. And of course, Ben... Malice in the palace, Ben Malice. Has anyone ever called you that before? So Nick Medellinos, you yeah. better listen to this. Yeah. Every time I was in New York, he used to call me Malice in the palace. Very good. I've always thought that would be the podcast title, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would be. Maybe it, we'll pivot that for episode two. Yeah, well, I don't think. Um, maybe if you if you go rogue and start your own pod. Well, you either that or if I start brawling on the basketball court down <laughs> yeah. at Loft just tonight, Malice we'll have good, ma- good reason for the name. Uh, if you don't know what Malice of the Palace is, just look it up on YouTube. Uh, the biggest brawl in NBA history. There's a very good Netflix documentary about it as yes. well. It's um, You have to see it to believe it. Yeah, Players fighting. This is shows our age. It's almost been 20 years since that happened. Yeah. But it is crazy that actually happened in an NBA game. Yep. And if you want to see Ron Artest and Stephen Jackson looking yeah. very jacked. Peak. <laughs> like tests, they were in peak physical condition. The um the interesting thing about that um the Malice in the Palace actually is that like you, from the outset like I didn't know much about it but you just see these players you're like oh idiot players like fighting but then I saw the doco and it actually shines a light on a bigger like the big picture of what actually happened and it, the players like they had beers thrown on them and they were just it, treated horribly. It's amazing that's happened and you've been to NBA games and yep. covered them in the States and yep. I have as well and until you see up close how compact these arenas are and yep. literally the distance we're sitting across this table from each other, yeah, that's what it's like in NBA arenas. We've got fans sitting courtside and yep. obviously some fans are nice, yeah, some fans not so much so in many ways it's surprising that hasn't happened more but yeah. There's something about the American subculture. Yeah, that unfortunately, if, if, you, if leads you're bored to and you like need something this. on Netflix, just look it up. I, I love like how we started the podcast yeah. talking about fighting in NBA brawls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's probably a good indication of where we're going to be in this podcast. So, um, if this is the first time you're listening to um, anything back chat, uh, you're just listening to me going, I don't know who the heck Dan Const is. But uh, look, this I've uh, we do a podcast on back chat. See, we do lots of footy stuff, general sports stuff. Um, I am a multiple time basketball champion. You were bragging about this this morning. Where yep. did this happen? What Loftus, league? What grade? What Loftus, age? Loftus grade D, I reckon, and Warwick grade C. Um, and I was probably mid twenties at the the prime of my peak physical condition. So yeah, won multiple championships, uh, and then I've also you know I was a journalist. I did some writing for um, for a basketball website in Dallas for the. Um, Dallas Mavericks. Yes. That's, that is the team in Dallas. Um, and then also worked at the Perth Wildcats in the media team for about a year and a bit and was, I, I guess, I won a championship there too. So we just winning goes everywhere you go. Exactly. It follows Dan. Whatever I, wherever I go, winning happens. Um, still a little bit jazzed. Well, sorry, a little bit annoyed at the Perth Wildcats because I never got my championship ring. Really? You've got to steal one off Bryce Cotton or someone. He's, He's got, got half that many. a dozen. Yeah. What's one for you? I know. So that's part of the deal. Like when you're working there, all the staff get them as well. And I left, I, you know, I was left the championship in Melbourne and I worked there for like another month and a half and then I left to do something else. And they just thought, oh, he's gone now. We don't need to get him a ring. I owe Wildcats, Perth Wildcats. I know you're well, all listening. Maybe this year, like I guess coming up, mm. happens to be the head coach of the Wildcats. Yes. It was our first interview on this podcast. Yes. And obviously we're... Winning's going to follow you and the Wildcats are going to win this year. So when that happens, John know. Riley yep. knows where to bring that championship I'll ring. S- I'll my, um, it. Exactly. I'll, s- I'll send my ring size, you know, medium left not finger. Not that you've measured it up. You haven't thought no, about no, this no, at no, all. Definitely not. Um, so that's who I am, you know, a champion. What so about how, how do I compare with that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'm a horrible uh, basketball player. My basketball career actually ended in Kalgoorlie when I was a teenager. That's where oh. I grew up. <laughs> I was no good, too short, too unskilled. Yeah. Yep. So I thought I'd just write about it and watch it. So yep. I've not worked for an NBL club, haven't won a championship like you. I was Can't lucky enough to work a lot with the pick and roll and get over and spend a full season covering the NBA in America, up close in Philadelphia, which was amazing. Get yep. to meet great people like yourself. And Nick Medellinos got to spend a full year covering Ben Simmons. I was with Philadelphia the year they lost to Toronto. Game seven, Kawhi Oof. Leonard. That bounce. One of the best shots I've ever seen in person, that bounce. Yep. That was the last NBA game I attended in person. So, again, wow. I kind of just lose on a high note like <laughs> you. <laughs> That's right. Win on a high note. That's good. Actually, I was just thinking about when we first met. Do you remember this? Do you remember when we first met? So I don't, but you were talking oh, about this last week, weren't that's you, right. the Wildcats game? Um, not to uh, go Kanye West on you, but... Um, i going to go Kanye West on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't remember when we first met, but um, I think because we followed each other on Twitter... 
and I just I think I made probably made the first move and sent you a DM or maybe you sent Didn't me a DM. Didn't we go to the garden for a beer? And we went to the garden yes, for a beer. Yes, I do remember now. The f- like I don't know many um, of my friends who have done this, but gone just like a platonic. A uh, blind date with another guy, but that's, a, that's See, essentially us, us men what need it was. to expand our friendships. Exactly, circles. we went for a, you know an awkward beer at the um, the garden. That one thing was on the Friday, and then I think I saw you at the garden on the Saturday. Probably like the next day. Probably that sounds like something I would have done. And five I think years I had ago. way more liquid courage in me, and I think I hugged you at some point. And I was like, literally met this guy yesterday. Well, probably you seem like a hugger. You were telling yeah. last week about the Wildcats game that we went to a couple of years ago, which again I don't remember. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> where apparently we got on the beers and had a great night. We did. Yeah. Either I'm someone else or this happened and I don't remember. I it. know. I don't feel very good about myself. You just don't remember who we are. So yeah. this is the Backchat Basketball Show. Um, on, on the other Backchat shows, talk about other sports, but this is purely basketball. Just we both hoops. love basketball. Just hoops. Uh, we're not going to go too analytical, not to like, you know, game by game recap because honestly, it's, it's sort of boring. It's just different names, different numbers. And you yeah. don't want to hear two guys from Perth talking about the analytics. Of I know, basketball. like I don't know anything. I, I I feel like I do when I watch games. I scream at the TV about the umpire making wrong decisions and people like not using pick and roll when it's there. Like, and I don't know what I'm talking about. So you just win, just like a head coach. You That's just right. All I do is win. Um, we will also have Greg Hire, who is a mm, former Perth yes. Wildcat, and he's a four time champion, a legit four time champion. <laughs> um, he's going to be checking in from time to time. Probably we're going to get him in every week if we can. Um, but he's a very busy man, so. Uh, that's the plan. Greg Heyer, Ben, Dan, the the basketball show that you need to be listening to, essentially. Um, let's get into some NBA news. Yes. So, Ben Simmons. Let's something go back to Ben. Something new? Yeah. Like, let's not talk about things that everyone's always talking about. <laughs> ben Simmons, all right? So, NBA, first time he's played in 470-ish days. Wow, it's been so that long. So, it's been that long. Uh, he plays his first game. He's moved on from the Philadelphia 76ers, now at the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, let's, let's, he did, so I did, I just said we're not going to talk about analytics numbers, but he did get six points, four rebounds, five assists. That's sort of important though. I want to get your thoughts on Ben Simmons. You did, like you said, covered him pretty closely in Philadelphia. He's become a bit of a villain in the NBA. What's your take on Ben Simmons? Villain's one word. I think he's become someone that's known more for the personality yep. than the basketball game. And you mentioned the stats from during the week. That's all well and good. I think the takeaway is that he was playing NBA games again. But you're right, he was someone, when I left Philadelphia in the middle of 2019, his career was on the upward swing. He'd just got his maximum contract, his team had made the second round of the playoffs. There was talk about this three-point shot, but it wasn't the hoopla it is now. And since then, his game has plateaued, and we know all this. Mm. I think heading into this season, obviously we need to see him on the court, but the last six years of his career has been leading to this point, and he's now facing a very very big season with the Nets because he has a team around him that can compete. He has no excuses anymore. Unfortunately, during that game during the week, the jump shot looks like it did three years ago, which isn't that great, but we'll give him time on that front. But it's time for Ben to get back on the basketball court and to remind the world why he is an NBA All-Star and has all the talent. And he did a good podcast with JJ Redick a couple of weeks ago. Yes. And finally let some people in and finally gave voice to things that a lot of us around the basketball world have known about for the past two years, but he hadn't been just giving voice to his story. And now that that's behind him, hopefully he can get back on the court and we can see the best of Ben. Yeah. But as we know, the NBA media cycle moves quick. It Mm -hmm. is a machine over in the States. And there was an element of goodwill in Philadelphia, especially when I was there being the number one overall draft pick and being the franchise player and someone a thirsty fan base wanted to believe in. All of that goodwill is gone now and it's just up to what he does on the court. So it's yeah. going to be a very interesting season ahead in Brooklyn. But we just want to see Ben out there, don't we, and see That's what right. he can get back to on the court. I think people in Australia as well um, wanted to see him play. And, and you know, the NBA is getting bigger and bigger in Australia every year. Um, and it helps when you have very good Australian players. So people pick teams based on, you know, I'll go for the 76ers because of Ben Simmons or, or now the Brooklyn Nets. So it is uh, a shame for, you know, Australian people that love the fan, love the, the single players that, you know, and then they're not playing. And then there was that whole also debacle of him playing for the Australian team. And then he pulled out sort of last minute. And I think people just generally have a, a bad taste left in their, in their mouth for Ben Simmons. But the thing is, basketball can can solve all that. And hopefully now on a new team, new situation. Yeah, it does. And I think a level of nuance is required with Ben as an Australian athlete, as you say. We have historically loved everything about our Australian athletes, not just basketball, but think of any Australian going overseas and yep. playing on a global stage. 
we obviously respect what they do as athletes, but it's not all good. There is some bad with anyone. And I think Ben is really testing that in basketball for the first yeah. time because, as you say, he's got all the talent in the world. And there have been some things that he has every right in doing, like not playing for the Boomers, which I support if that's what's best for him. But you're right in what you're saying, that people back here, the discussion has turned a lot the last few months and the last couple of years away from basketball. And fundamentally, that's what he is great at. And yeah. I think we're all hoping he can get back to that all-star level form. But if he doesn't, there will be reasons for that and the discourse will be very interesting. It happens a lot with Australian athletes, like you said, on a global stage. Think of like Liz Cambage, yeah. who extremely talented, like very good at basketball at, you know, um, probably one at, the, at her peak, the best in the league, like in those sorts of areas. Um, but then like she she does, like says some things that turn people off a bit and then all of a sudden people just hate her essentially. Yeah. Happened in... Like Nick Kyrgios is another example, extremely talented, like when he wants to be one of the best tennis players in the world. But then there's things that Australian people, or well, just general people, just sort of get turned but off by them. You know what happens when they win, they become Australian exactly. again and we throw our arms around him. Look at Nick Kyrgios in January this year at the Australian Open. Oh, at Wimbledon. everyone backed him. All the court cases, all the questionable things he's said and done off yep. the court, they disappear. And I think Ben's bring this circle back to Ben. It's exactly the same thing. That if he's holding up the NBA championship in June, oh yeah, then just watch all people will be back. Exactly, the boomers won't even be a discussion. The jump shot won't even be a discussion because yep. it'll be a case of an Australian winning on the global stage. And that's right. Obviously, we'd all like to see that. Mm. Whether it happens or not, on that uh, Nets team with our friend Kyrie Irving, yeah, who knows? But again, good for us, good for content, and that's right. we'll be getting some people a couple of my journalist friends from Philadelphia mm -hmm. on the podcast over the next sure. month so we can yeah. get a local snapshot and see what it's like when Ben actually returns there for a game proper. Definitely. I think it also shines a light on people like Paddy Mills, Ash Barty, like these Australian athletes who've gone over on global stage and that are champions and they are just like awesome. Like they don't put a foot wrong oh. and they're like literally gods. Like Paddy Mills is amazing. He was yeah. actually in town a couple yeah, of weeks ago doing a speaking circuit and – I went along to that and I didn't even know this, but some of the stuff he's doing to bring fresh water into indigenous communities around Australia, yeah. taking it out of basketball for a second, that yeah. is just yeah, goat level status. That's yeah. beyond amazing. Yeah. That's, he's a legend. He is. That's yeah. something we should all aspire towards. And again, for me, that was a good reminder that while basketball and sport and tennis are the vehicles that we use to see these athletes up close, yeah. the real impact they have and their real greatness and while they're a hero, some of them, has nothing to do with what they do on the court. It's all about the money that they bring back to this country and the impact they have for yeah. their community, whatever that looks like. Uh, coming back home a little bit, um, we'll talk about some NBL stuff. And, and we do have um, the head coach of the Perth Wildcats, JR, Mr. John Riley. Uh, John, really coming in to chat on the show after yes. this, um, give us some good insight on coaching. I, I'm not really interested in asking about like what's Bryce's ankle looking like, what's, you know, how the boy's feeling. Because... You know, he's a smart guy. He's going to say all the right things. So we'll ask him some good questions about his journey and coaching. Um, so MBL, sort of at home but abroad as well, the Adelaide 36ers become the first team in MBL history to beat an NBA side. Yeah, Did how you, amazing. Yeah, it was just so awesome. I was watching it loosely like on the side because I was like, these games always just like end up sort of being blowouts and they're not super interesting. The NBA teams don't really try. Um, and so I had it on and just... I just I just kept looking over and Adelaide was just hitting shot after shot after shot and it 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 happens a lot. NBL teams go out and they're up by like 15 points midway through the second quarter because they are like throwing everything at them, right? They really really want to win. And then by three quarter time, NBA teams like all right, someone's like we'll just we'll, we'll win. Yeah, we'll kill. Uh, this didn't happen this time though. No, well I know we said we aren't going to get too statsy off the top. Yeah. But they hit 24 threes, the 36ers, in that game against Phoenix. And I am copying this off my friend Kane Pittman. Well, I heard this a few podcast during the week. Yep. That last year in NBA games, only 17 times did a team hit 24 threes. Huge. And they won every time. Yeah. And, and it's a longer ex It's a longer line. Time. And yep. they were just going berserk from three. And I yep. don't care who you are. If you make 24 threes in a game and yep. make an extra 15 in the opposition, you're going to win the game. So yep. obviously for the 36ers themselves, that's got to be a tremendous confidence boost they're actually going up against okc later in the week yep the biggest storyline i've got coming out of that was what it actually means for their season going forward and whether their best players actually played too well and might be getting poked by <laughs> nba yeah, teams that's right. over yeah. the next week because we've seen some news come out 
over the past 24 hours that a couple of 36 players are back on the NBA's radar. Yeah. And while that would be wonderful for them personally, it mm. would be the most ironic Stitch thing ever Adelaide. if you have the greatest win in the history of your program and your franchise yep. and you lose your best player because of that <laughs> and it sinks your yeah. professional season. That's right. Um, you've been in uh, plenty of NBA games in, in arenas and um, you know, this is, even happens in the NBL. When, when a team or a player just keeps hitting shots... Oh, there's nothing like it. It's amazing. And the crowd you hear these like audible gasps and like even when it's the opposition team, everyone's like, oh, like again. And that's what was happening. This like sold out, what was it sold out? this packed crowd, this American, uh, this American arena um, and just the crowd reactions. And on Twitter, like people don't really pay attention to these games usually. Like all the biggest Twitter NBA guys were showing highlights. Mitch McCarron did one of the most ridiculous passes I've ever seen. Yeah, that that got shared like crazy. So it's just awesome for the game. Awesome for the NBL. You've got to remember that a lot of American basketball watchers haven't heard of the 36ers to begin with yep. and wouldn't have heard of half the play. Mitch McCarron, they wouldn't know him from a bar of soap. No. It would be like Mason Cox's brother coming over and beating up the Eagles in some yeah. big final, which his brother actually did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, But I think just the stark contrast of seeing that and – Obviously, all the cliched things we can talk about in terms of how it validates the NBL, it validates the 36ers, that goes without saying. But I think fundamentally, it's just great awareness for everyone involved that the 36ers yeah. go over there. And like you say, there is nothing like being in an NBA or a basketball arena full stop yeah. when you've got a wing player or a shooter yeah. just pulling up and nailing shot after shot after shot. Yeah. And it's almost cooler and a better experience when yeah. you don't actually know who these players are, yeah. which I bet most of that crowd in Phoenix... Yep. wouldn't have known who these Adelaide 36ers players are yeah. and to see them go into Phoenix and make shot after shot after shot, yep. it truly is remarkable and it's, uh, I'm sure, to be turned into a TV show or a movie or a podcast <laughs> yeah, or something one day right. back down here yeah. and it's a great story for all involved. Um, it's funny, with, uh, with that happening to Phoenix, I went to a game in San Francisco when the Warriors played Phoenix and... Um, Clay Thompson, I think, scored 35 and a quarter. Were you there that night? That, yeah, and I was yeah, well. there and... It was the same. Like he was pulling up from everywhere. You just every time he threw the ball up, you're like, "That's going in," and it still was like, just people went crazy. It's a, it's an awesome. Was um, that an oracle yeah. or back in? It was an oracle. Yeah. yeah. So that place when that got loud, there is nothing like it because it was a big, yeah, concrete jungle big dome thing. And yeah. once Steph or once Clay or even Durant when he was there started making a couple yep. of shots, the fans just started making yep. this noise and it would reverberate, and then yeah. they'd go on these massive runs. Yeah, and it was like being an R and B concert. Yeah, some of my favourite nights in the NBA <laughs> have been at Oracle. That team was obviously amazing. Yeah, but the fans in that arena and the Oakland community. Yeah, yeah, wow, that was a tremendous arena. It's obviously great that they're in San Francisco for their money making now, but yeah, I do pour one out a little bit for oracle sometimes and i miss being able to go to games out there yeah um all right let's go one more thing uh on, on the world stage of basketball i'm gonna butcher his last name victor wembanyama i'm just gonna call him victor victor <laughs> wembanyama i know i did it. i absolutely yeah. nailed it um he's been touted as the number one draft pick for next year probably he's seven foot three he's so long but he plays like a guard. He does all these crazy good things. Um, there was highlights everywhere today on the internet because they played at a NBA, uh, NBL, sorry, NBA G League Ignite. Like yep. there's that many little things there in a game, and he was just doing crazy things, pulling, uh, pulling up from like outside the three step backs. I it, it just look up Victor Wembanyama Benyama on YouTube. And you're going to see some amazing highlights from today. Yeah, again, even just looking at him walking into an NBA arena, he had to duck his head to get under the metal detectors to get into yeah, the arena. Yeah, that's right. He's seven foot four and he was too big to go into the metal detector. So his body for a 17, 18 year old is incredible. Yeah. I suggest all the listeners out there go and search his name into Twitter or Instagram and just find some amazed. photos of this yep. morning. There's one I saw of him doing a bridge like you do, a bridge pose at the gym yep. on the court before the game. And he looks like an alien. His feet are <laughs> massive. His legs yeah. are so long. Yeah. And then to see that translate onto the court, obviously against a G League Ignite team, it was only small doses. It was one game. All the caveats we know. I'm happy to just throw everything out and say he's going to be the best player I've ever seen. He looked like a baby giraffe <laughs> yeah. that knew how to play basketball and the yeah. step back shots. And I think the defense is the thing for me. Like seeing someone yeah. with that wingspan you can't, being able to go take, at him. You can't. Yeah. You can't. Imagine him on OKC with Chet Holmgren. That's just one yeah. team that is going to be losing a lot. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway from this morning is these NBA teams like the Utah Jazz, the Spurs, yep. the Thunder, they're going to be trading all their veteran players tomorrow. They're yeah. going to be trying to lose every single game now. Yeah. 
because we know the NBA loves a rebuild. They love tanking. Yeah. If it leads time. to getting a superstar. And while I still have some doubts whether his body is going to hold up for the next 20 years, what he showed this morning is incredible. And yep. yeah, imagine that guy playing on your favourite basketball team It'd for be the awesome. next 15 years. Oh, you just you tune in just to watch the highlights anyway. He um In, in the NBA, it's, uh, it, it's common for... Uh, sorry, it's not that common that a player is that good in the draft where teams will go, we will like to tank for them. Like Zion comes to mind. Um, uh, like that's just the, the one, the most recent one. Anthony ones. Davis. Anthony it was Davis. The same. Yeah. Kevin Durant, it was the same. Yeah. But, um, but it's not like AFL where, you know, the, the number one draft pick's always not going to change your team. But this is a guy who teams will literally bottom out for because they want him that bad. Yeah, and I think as well, the Scoot Henderson was on the other team today who's the second yes. projected pick in the draft. He went yep. for almost 30 points yep. and looked amazing himself. So you're right, there's these two guys that yep. NBA teams will be fawning themselves over. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you want some cheap tickets to NBA games in uh, March and April and you fancy going to the States, I'd be hitting up San Antonio, Oklahoma yep. City, Salt Lake City. Yeah, because those teams going out there are going to be very, very bad, all with the hopes of losing games, so that they can hopefully draft one of these two guys. And yep. like you say, five guys on the court every time, a bit different to AFL. Yeah. So the impact of drafting one of these players is so big. For sure. Uh, for a team, a team that we don't want to lose very much this year is the Perth Wildcats. Yes. Um, look, this isn't a Perth Wildcats podcast. It's not, but we are in Perth. Um, I probably will have a soft spot for them. Um, used and, to work for them. And go for them. Used to work for them. Um, so yeah, we do hope they do well. So let's uh, let's go to, to have a chat with Jr. Now their coach, um, who's gonna he's gonna come into the studio. Like this is let's be honest. I'll be completely transparent with you. We recorded this bit after we talked to him. So <laughs> we're gonna do this awkward throw, and it's gonna go to him. But uh, here's uh, John Reilly, the coach of the Perth Wildcats. All right, John Reilly, coach of the Perth Wildcats in your first season. Welcome to Back Chat, the basketball show. Excited to be on back chat, lads. Yeah, Happy to be here. In. No yeah. problem. Thank you. Let's. Um, we always ask one question to guests that come into the back chat studios, and we know you're a basketballer at heart. Rookie of the year, scoring title winner, <laughs> champion, all of that. But what's your greatest sporting achievement? Uh, not on the basketball court. I know you've played a bit of cricket, a bit of footy. Yeah. Oh, look, my fondest memory, or I guess where I can big note myself a little bit, is uh, my first ever six in cricket was against Matthew Hayden. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> Toowoomba wow. versus the White Bay. Yes. 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 I remember good. it, and it happened to be two in a row. Two. Two off Hayden in a row. <laughs> he was bouncing me as a 12-year-old. Oh, he, he was a big <laughs> lad as a 12-year-old. Very good. Like you said, so from Toowoomba, mm -hmm. um, developed into... Did you play basketball always as a kid? Was that your first um, point of call for sport? I was fortunate enough to always be around the sport because my father played. Um, but coming up in the family, uh, we just played a lot of different sports. Um, but basketball was consistently there um, amongst all the other things as well. Yeah. yeah. Getting over to college in the US, was that always a dream when you were growing up in Queensland? Uh, probably like when I got to like my middle teenage years, that's where the excitement for that path become apparent. Uh, and that was in the days, I, like I wrote handwritten notes to coaches and then I took myself on a tour to try and get over there because it's not like it was today where people are, are scouring our country for players. So uh, I, I worked out of high school, earned enough money so I could pay for my own way for two years, but I was lucky enough after my first year to get a scholarship. And writing those letters, was there a certain college that you had in mind? Was there any dreams of landing somewhere or was it just a case of getting anywhere over to the US? Yeah, I was just giving it a crack. I just felt like uh, I was oblivious. I just thought if you got to the US and you played, you'd have a good chance of making it. And that was my attitude. And I ended up in a great situation in, in Tacoma, Washington at Tacoma Community College. And what was that experience like coming from Queensland and landing in to Washington? To Washington? Yeah, look, it, it was an eye opener because uh, the coach didn't know who I was. That wasn't you weren't exchanging game film or anything like that. So I was really on a like a tryout. And the way that works is you're like in a basketball class with like uh, 40 other guys that are trying to make the team. So here I was, I was just out there plan and hoping to make the team and uh, it's funny like the first day there's 40 guys the second day it's down to 20 like half just, just give up cut. the dream pretty quickly no not even cut right. but you know like that's how loose it was junior college like um you're in school one day you're gone the next what were you writing on the handwritten notes 
uh, as much as a 17 year old can try and <laughs> pump up their own tires in words and trust me i'm no english major yeah because you can't like you said you couldn't well you're not sending film over so they just have to read a letter and go this sounds this sounds right yeah and look at the end of the day i was prepared to pay for myself so the school really had nothing to lose yeah. um and and it worked out very well yeah what was the decision like um to uh, stop going to co college in Washington and then head back to the NBL in Australia. You started around the mid-90s? Yeah, so uh, my college eligibility finished at Gonzaga um, and Brisbane Bullets started recruiting me after my second year in college uh, and I guess I was cocky or arrogant and I so said, no, like, you know, I want two more years, I want to keep playing, I'll get a better contract and at the end, Bullets were still the only team recruiting me and they got to sign me for less money. <laughs> <laughs> great business decision <laughs> well it worked right you came in one rookie of the year were you expecting it to come that easy when you started playing pro back home no uh, because before I moved to the US I tried to reach out and get involved with a few NBL clubs but uh, you know their evaluation was I wasn't good enough so I always had like that chip on my shoulder or the thought that I still got to make it and prove it because I hadn't come through the mainstream avenues over here so I always and to this day, I always feel like I have something to prove. And there's a lot of talk now about the level of basketball down in Australia relative to the US. How did you find that transition playing from Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament to playing in the NBL in the 90s? What was that transition like? Yeah, the, the transition from college to pro, and Brady Mannix doing a little bit of this right now, is in college you have a very structured and rigid day. Like you go to class, you meet with your coach, you meet with professors, you practice, you lift weights where here all of a sudden you're lifting and you're playing basketball, but that the rest of the, your day is for you to figure out. Um, so y college, it's unbelievable how they can figure a way to fill in your day where pros, we're more mindful of your well-being, your recovery and all of that type of stuff. So, uh, and, and on that Bulls team, I was the only single guy, so everyone was going home to their families and so forth. So uh, you're just trying to navigate that landscape. Yeah. Are you, um, how does that work now with you sort of coaching guys that are coming over from college like Brady? Um, are you having to help manage them a little bit more when they've come from such structure? Yeah, look, I think I have a, a maybe a better understanding or appreciation of what they're coming from. Uh, everyone's different. Like there's some guys that would just enjoy being uh, available to have that amount of time for himself. Uh, where Brady, he's very close to his family. He's like his parents, I think, missed one college game in his five years. Wow. So for him to come this way and his parents won't get here for probably another month. Um, so him, like, it, there's a lot of dynamic outside of basketball that goes into what he's used to. Yeah, and what about you as a coach even now, coming back from coaching in college and coaching mm -hmm. in the NBL again, what's that transition like from coaching students yeah. that are in that mindset you're talking about to coaching men that are playing professionally for their livelihoods? Yes, yeah, like my approach and uh, the way I try to interact with them, that doesn't change. But, uh, you know, when you're a college coach, you're trying to mentor young men, 18 to 22-year-olds. Uh, we're here. Uh, I've inherited a very mature team, family guys, all of that. They're very secure with who they are and what they're doing in their life. But I do have to be mindful, like a Jesse Wagstaff, who has three kids, like, I have three kids, so I understand, like, it's not all peaches and cream when they go to <laughs> bed, you know. So uh, understanding that there will be a day where he can come to practice and he may be operating on a couple hours sleep. So uh, my own family experience coming from college, hopefully I, I do have a good understanding of where everyone's coming from. Yeah. Back to some of your um your NBL playing days. After winning Rookie of the Year, what's the, the pressure of life for you to back that up? And, um, and come back and, and be good again? Yeah, good good question in the fact that, uh, like, that award probably surprised me a little bit in the fact that um, I didn't know what to expect coming back to the NBL. I was lucky to play for a good Brisbane Bullets team and play a lot of meaningful minutes. Uh, then I moved to Adelaide. Then all of a sudden, that's the first time uh, Mike Dunlap, who was the coach, he sits me down and goes, like, we have a level of expectation. So it was really the first time in my career someone sat me down and said, this is what we're expecting. Um, so then it did, it, it's a learning curve. 
um, because then all of a sudden your mindset does get a little shock. At the time, what was it like coping with those expectations for the first time? As you say, you were a big dog back in Australia playing professionally. Yeah, I, I didn't handle it well. I, I remember this and I've told it to some of the guys on the team. So in Adelaide, we came to Perth to play two preseason games. And ironic enough, Bunbury and Joondalup we played. Um, but after the first game, I went up to Dunlap's uh, room at the hotel, knocked on it uh, because I was loving playing for him but I was not performing at a at a level that I knew was satisfactory and all of that but I wanted to reinforce how I was enjoying it and we had this conversation that was probably done in a minute he goes well that's good because I thought you'd come up to quit <laughs> so um, you know that's when that re- whole reality of of professional sport really starts to you know be ingrained in you and you understand the dynamic of it all. Speaking of playing the Wildcats, you uh, you went pretty hot on an elimination game <laughs> against the team. Um, what was what was your memories of that day? Yeah, we were fortunate enough the Townsville Crocs come in here with really nothing to lose. In the fact that I don't think even half of our own supporter base and ownership group would have thought we were going to win that game. Um, so you know that was towards the end of my career. You take a different, a cavalier approach because you never know when your last game may be. Uh, and I just come in and let it fly. And the minute the first one went down, I felt pretty good about how the rest of the <laughs> other 30, 47 minutes would go. <laughs> and that game you also... Was that the same game where Homicide was going Burke on the sidelines? Yeah, ended up ripping his jersey off and, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah saying a few choice words to the fans. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's Corey Williams who... You know, we are recording this over in Perth and he's had a an interesting relationship with the Perth fans because yep. he's gone hard at the Wildcats a fair bit, which yep. is he's, honestly, he's a genius. Like, love him or hate him, he has found himself as one of the most popular mm-hmm. voices in the NBL. Definitely. Um, what, what's it like for you seeing him just mouthing <laughs> off to the <laughs> crowd? And, and has he, like, hit you up since you've been back at the Wildcats? Uh, him, him mouthing off to people. The first day he walked in the gym as the croc, that, that was him. That's who he is. That's who will be going to his grave. Um, He's done a great job of marketing that aspect of himself to a full-time job. So you've got to appreciate that ability. Not everyone has that. (laughs) Um, Has he reached out? Like Corey and I, uh, because we played, uh, we were teammates for three years. We've communicated all through it. Now when he's pumping my tires up and how good the Perth Wildcats that's when I get that's <laughs> yeah. when I get nervous to stop that <laughs> <laughs> kiss of death you know yeah so and you also played with um Todd Blanchfield is yep. that right and now you coach him yeah so I, I actually didn't play with uh Todd or Mitch but both of them were in their like 17 18 year old range and right. they they'd been coming through to practices and during school holidays that would be a huge part of the crocs during practice so um, I've, I've known those guys for quite some time, yeah. yeah. What's it like coming full circle on that? You saw these guys as teenagers and now you're their head coach. Yeah, 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 the best thing about that for me is those guys knew who I was as a person as well as obviously my playing career, but they helped probably bridge the gap with some of the people within the organisation that didn't know me the type of person I was. So I can lean on them and, you know, I, I certainly lean on them for how the club operates, what things work, what things don't work, um, because we do have that rapport and relationship. And we're doing some research of this, and I noticed you mentioned a couple of times how you wanted to, if you came back to the NBL, it had to be the right fit with the right club. Yep. Why is the Wildcats, uh, I'm putting words in your mouth, but why did the Wildcats tick those boxes and why did you want to pursue this? Yeah, so uh, I feel like I'm going to be involved in this game for a long time. Uh, The sport's been great to me. I want to be great back to the sport Um, and every franchise isn't the same uh, as much as everyone likes to say they are so Perth Wildcats has a lot of expectation they have great history great expectation I like that I know that I wouldn't function good where people are just trying to make something good like to walk in be with a franchise of Perth status to have one of the league's best players if not the best player in Bryce Cotton to start your head coaching job uh, role uh, with that you, you're hitting the ground running and obviously last season was the end of a streak that's been talked about for so long is that almost an exciting thing for you coming in and getting to reset and taking the franchise forward <laughs> off what was a disappointing end to last season yeah you can say the streak ended but uh, one thing I try to point out is they were 16 and 12 
Um, if you're a business and you operated at 16 and 12, you'd still be a pretty successful business, I think, if that was considered your down year. Um, the streak as far as being done, like my expectation is playoffs and higher. So um, e- even if the streak wasn't broken in this opportunity, like our expectation wouldn't have changed. And what about the process of interviewing for a head coaching job? What was that like sitting down with Danny and the owners and yeah. going through that formal process? Yeah, so uh, the rewind 12 months before that, I was in the mix uh, the previous previous time. Uh, you learn a lot going through that process. The thing that I would say and I would confidently say that they noticed is I was more confident in my approach and just my bravado about pursuing and wanting the job uh, versus probably hoping I wanted the job the first time around. I reckon I've done probably <clears throat> 10 job interviews in my life, maybe more, 15. And it's always like, you know, what will you bring to our company? What are your strengths? Cool. Like, what yep. does a basketball head coaching interview look like? Are they getting you to show you what you're going to do with the team and, and things like that? What are the sort of differences? Yeah, so basketball first, I think you, you need to be able to show that you have a game plan, what your offense, what your defense is. Uh, or you feel confident in what you're coaching. Uh, now, once you get there, the players really dictate how that evolves because uh, at the end of the day, good players make great coaches. I'll go out on a limb and point me in the direction of a good coach who had also ran players. Like, good coaches have really, really good players. Um, but the other part of it, obviously, with what had gone on with the Perth Wildcats, some of those things needed to be addressed, understanding the dynamic of the club, the expectation. Um, so I just pointed out uh, the, my personality and what I can bring. I think I could really help with that part of it all. I had certainly an understanding and knowledge, although I never played for Perth. I, I could respect it from a distance, and I I felt those 8,000, 9,000 fans on my shoulders, you know. So um, that part of it and just the way I was going to interact with the players and how I could build it into a good team. Mm. You um, did have a pretty good start so far. Darwin <laughs> had, a, had a pretty good result yep. and, um, and also the first game. What was uh, going up to Darwin and um, being in that environment like for the preseason? What, what was good about Darwin is we got to go away as a team so I could spend you know get to know guys personalities and we got to be around each other they would get to see how I operate a little bit better Uh, we get got to play three games in five days so uh, there's going to be a stretch in this season where we have something similar so you I have to figure out how do we manage that how do we manage players and you know how's someone going to be after they've played a couple games the rest and all of that type of stuff so uh, for me that was good Uh, the players get a lot of the like media stuff out of the way so during the season a lot of that's removed from them so uh, players got to play a lot of minutes and we got to see each other as human beings versus just basketball players did you get a tech when you're in darwin no you didn't no did you get you got some warnings and some oh some I words did, of no from, i did from <laughs> i i got i got two you got two techs two out of three games yes <laughs> almost, almost a perfect strike right yeah correct, <laughs> correct. is that is that going to be a, a staple are you, are you a fire on the sidelines you're gonna you know use uh, up your, your tech limit i'm, I'm for sure going to be passionate yeah. now how people determine that that's up to them but i'm, I'm going to be passionate um that that's how i played that's that's how i feel the sport uh, i get to do what i love um, and if I want to be passionate, that's what the fans and that's what the NBL is going to get. Do you yeah. feel like you have to rein that in sometimes? As you say, you were a very passionate, a very mm. loud player in terms of how you were acting on the court. Do you have to go against your impulses sometimes on the sideline? You, you, as a coach and even as a player, you do have to figure out when the right time is. So I certainly have to become experienced in the moment and when's the right time, when's the wrong time. Um, so I was utilising the preseason in my own way to figure <laughs> some of those things out. And um, your dad was in Darwin. Yep. That's pretty cool. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, so, like, grew up in Toowoomba. Dad still lives in our family home. Um, but he's a basketball junkie, and especially when he can follow his own kids and grandkids and so forth around. So he just jumps in his Land Cruiser and drives up to Darwin, checks out the Blitz and then drives down to Perth so he can take in a few uh, Red Army games. That's pretty special. So he's driven all that way. Yes, yep. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are amazed by this, but uh, 
three, four times a year, he'll go on like a road trip to discover Australia. He loves going to the outback, Kakadu, you know, up into the north of Queensland, you know, down into South Australia, Kuba Pedi, all those types of places. So um, it, it's, look, it's a monumental effort, no doubt, but it, it's in his wheelhouse and it's <laughs> just a great way for him to see the country and see his son coach as well. Does, does that traitor uh, come down a generation? Are you like him? Will you get in your <laughs> car when the season's done and drive halfway around the country? Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a little more selective. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind going for a good drive, but there really has to be a good purpose at the end of the drive. Yeah, jump in the Subaru. You, you, don't, you don't have the Land Cruiser at home. There you yeah. go. Yeah, stay on the bitumen road. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, John, thanks so much for your, your time. Um, thanks for being our very first guest, being on the very first episode of the Backchat Basketball Show. Um, big season ahead. One game down, a lot more to go. Um, any thoughts moving forward for the team? Uh, none for the team. I just hope uh, this was good enough so Backcheck gets a second episode. <laughs> yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 let, we'll, we'll let you know next week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for anyone listening, you can find us on our uh, YouTube Backchat page. Just search Backchat. Um, you find all of our podcasts there. If you're listening, you know where you listen to because it's on Spotify. And if you want to follow us on Instagram, it's Backchat underscore basketball. I assume we'll get a follow as you're leaving today. Made from your son, Kale, perhaps. Um, it, it'll be my son's <laughs> domain. I don't have Insta. I'm not hip enough. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John.